This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Let's say that we had a fraction so large that we could call it infinite. A fraction such that it repeats itself in this pattern forever. What could this equal? Infinity? One? Two? How could we even compute this? A nice starting point to solve something we can't solve is to find something similar that we can solve. Rather than have the entire infinitely large fraction, let's just take the first few bits of the fraction as a sequence of numbers. Since these are finite fractions, we can compute the actual value and see if we can determine a trend. Although I've only displayed the first couple terms, if we continue to calculate the values in the sequence, we can see that the value oscillates up and down, getting close to some value between one and two. Even if we can't calculate the exact value this way, it does give us a good idea of roughly what we're looking for. The next thing we can try to do is determine a trend. Something that we can notice is that we have a 1 in u of 1, and this appears again in u of 2, although this may seem a little redundant. But if we look at u of 2, this appears in the base of u of 3. Again, u of 3 appears in the base of u of 4, and u of 4 appears in the base of u of 5, which is now quite useful since we can determine a trend. We can say that u of n plus 1, or in other words, the next term in the sequence, is just 1 plus 1 over the current term. Writing the sequence in terms of another term in the sequence is called a recurrence relationship, and this can be a lot more useful to solve the fraction. Considering the sequence that this recurrence relationship produces, we can see that the final term, or u of infinity, will be exactly equal to the fraction we want to calculate. Our aim now is to find the last term of the sequence, and to do this we're going to use a new technique which we're going to derive. The technique we use is based on this claim. As n tends to infinity, u of n equals u of n plus 1. It's always annoying when a method states a lot of random symbols and makes a lot of claims without any proof. So let's look into where this comes from and what it really means. Let's let n tend to infinity, which means we're letting n become the largest possible number. If n grows to be infinity, then n plus 1 will also become infinity, since infinity is equal to infinity plus 1. This may seem a little strange, since the algebra would suggest otherwise, but it's important to remember that infinity isn't an actual number, but rather a tool and an idea that we can use to solve problems. Given that these statements are true, then as n tends to infinity, n equals n plus 1, and then therefore we can say that u of n equals u of n plus 1. When I first saw this proof, I wasn't happy with the steps, since it feels as though we're making some bold claims which in theory are true, but practically shouldn't work. For now, we're going to assume that these steps lead to the claim highlighted at the bottom, although we'll discuss the reliability of the claim later in the video. Let's look back at the original fraction, and remember that we're trying to find the last term in the sequence we derived earlier. From now on, we're going to write u of infinity in a slightly different way. We're going to write u of infinity is equal to the limit of n to infinity of u of n. The lim just means a limit, and this format is the proper way to write u of infinity since, as we mentioned earlier, infinity isn't an actual number, but rather a tool. So we're essentially saying, let n become incredibly large. We are now looking for what this new limit equals. Again, the limit of n to infinity of u of n plus 1 is equal to the limit of n to infinity of u of n, for the same reasoning we had earlier. Now, we can substitute the formula we obtained from the start of the video for the recurrence relationship. To make it clear we are tending n to infinity for both sides of the equation, I'll use square brackets around the entire thing. We can highlight the parts of the equation we're trying to solve for. Now let's use the new technique we have. We can see that the conditions to use this rule are satisfied in the equation, so now we can substitute u of n plus 1 with u of n. This will make the equation much easier to solve, as now we only have a single unknown. After some simple rearranging, where we multiply the top and bottom by u of n, and then collect like terms on one side, we have something which looks quite familiar to a lot of you, a quadratic. We can now easily solve for u of n by substituting the coefficients from the quadratic above, and we get the solution that u of n is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. It's important to note that this is for u of n as n tends to infinity. 
Considering the equation that we have and remembering that the limit of u of n as n tends to infinity is the original infinite fraction, we can resubstitute the fraction into our equation to get our solution. Something that we can immediately notice is that our fraction has no negative components, which means it would be impossible for it to yield a negative solution, which means we can discount the plus or minus from our solution, leaving us with the value of this fraction being exactly 1 plus the square root of 5 all over 2. So, we've answered the original question, but there's some interesting things that we can note about this solution. The first thing is that we can see that the value of our solution is roughly 1.6, and this agrees with the deduction that we made that u of n is greater than 1 and less than 2. And this further reinforces why we shouldn't get a negative solution. The next thing to notice is that the solution is irrational, yet none of the numbers in the fraction are irrational. If we have a number c which is irrational, then c cannot be written in the form a over b, where a and b are integers, or in more normal words, the square root of 5 can't be written as a fraction, by definition. Something you may have figured out, however, is that we can easily rearrange our fraction to solve for the square root of 5. By multiplying both sides by 2, and then subtracting 1, and then simplifying, we have an exact approximation for the square root of 5. You can actually do this with the square root of 2 and the square root of 3 using the exact same method. In fact, you can do this for any irrational number. But this directly contradicts our definition of an irrational number. So where did this break? The component which is essential to remember is this symbol at the bottom, and more importantly, this symbol. This solution is the solution when the number of terms in the fraction is not close to infinity, but actually infinity. Any finite number of terms will always produce a finite fraction, but precisely when their fraction is infinitely long, it will equal exactly this solution. So, we've solved the original question, but I'm sure a lot of you understand the method, but feel as though we've made a lot of bold assumptions which could create some contradictions. For example, let's consider a new sequence of numbers, such that u of 1 is 1 and u of 2 is 2 and so on. It's quite easy to deduce that the relationship between terms in this sequence can be described by the next term being one more than the current term. Again, let's try to find the final term in the sequence. So let's limit n to infinity on both sides of the equation. Again, using the exact same steps, we can substitute u of n with u of n plus 1. We can then subtract u of n from both sides of the equation and then simplify. And we are left with the solution. And as there are no terms including n, we can remove the limit, leaving us with the solution that 0 equals 1. But obviously, 0 doesn't equal 1. So what went wrong? Let's reconsider the first sequence of numbers that we used and compare it to the second sequence to see the differences and see why 1 works and 1 breaks. Since these terms are just finite fractions, we can simplify them to more condensed fractions which makes them easier to understand their approximate values, and we can make this even more clear by writing them as decimals. We discussed earlier that we could assume that the solution would lie somewhere between 1 and 2, since even from the first couple terms it seems to be approaching some value. To make this trend even more clear, we can use terms even further in the sequence to determine a trend. Let's consider u of 5, 10 and 20. u of 5 is equal to 1.6, u of 10 is slightly above u of 5, and u of 20 is marginally below u of 10. We can see that the sequence is approaching some value, and this trend can be seen even more clearly by rewriting u of 1 like this. We can actually substitute the solution that we generated earlier, and we can see that the theoretical last term of this sequence is the same as u of 20 to 8 significant figures, which is unbelievably close. And this is really strong evidence supporting that the answer that we have is correct. Let's now consider the second sequence of numbers. We can again use larger values in the sequence, since we can try to determine a trend that way. We can see that a of 10 is 10, and a of 100 is 100, and so on. We can see an evident trend here, where this sequence will continue to grow forever, and will never converge to any particular value. When we then ask what the last term of the sequence will be, we can see why our formula breaks, and although we can deduce in this case by inspection that u of infinity is infinity, 
there are many sequences where we cannot easily presume a solution. We can see that the claim that we made does hold for any sequence, but will only yield a useful solution with the caveat that the sequence is converging. Some of you may think that generating solutions, like in the second example, where we get false statements such as 0 equals 1, are pointless, but this in itself can be very useful. For sequences where it's hard to determine, by inspection, whether it's convergent or divergent, this method can be very useful to prove its nature, where diverging sequences produce contradictions and converging sequences will produce very specific values. And these two are very famous examples of converging and diverging sequences where it's very difficult to tell their nature. Considering all the techniques that we have, let's ask a new problem. What does cos of cos of cos of cos forever equal? Let's try to determine if this is converging or diverging. And if it is converging, let's try to determine what it actually equals. Please give this a try yourself. And if you do enjoy interactive problem solving, which covers a diverse range of topics and unique skills, which is easy and free, please consider signing up with the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that offers you a vast array of courses in science, mathematics, engineering, and more. Whether you're a student looking to breeze through your math exams or a professional aiming to sharpen your analytical abilities, Brilliant has something for everyone. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from the fundamentals to the complex real world applications of the most interesting areas of maths, and it's constantly updated with new lessons every month. Brilliant actually offers a more in-depth look into continued fractions and recurrence relationships, which is perfect consolidation after this video, reinforcing the ideas discussed now and looking into more fascinating and advanced problems. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, consider visiting brilliant.org slash vix, which is in the description and the pinned comment which will give you full access to all of Brilliant's courses. Only the first 200 subscribers to use the link will get the full 20% discount off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Going back to the question we asked earlier, let's begin to decompose the number into a sequence of numbers in a similar way we did earlier. We can deduce that the next term in the sequence is just cos of the current term. To now find the last term in the sequence, will take limits of both sides of n to infinity. As all the conditions are satisfied to use our rule, we can substitute u of n plus 1 with u of n. Then this simplifies to u of n equals cos u of n. And as u of n is just some variable, to make it more clear, we can substitute x to resemble this number. We are looking to solve x equals cos x, which looks deceptively easy to solve, although actually it turns out to be impossible. The solution to this is actually transcendental, which means it's similar to e in pi, in that we can't actually write out the entire solution to this, and that the solution is an infinite, unrepeating list of decimals. We can actually draw the graphs for cos x and x to see if they intersect at any points, since these will lead to our solutions, and we actually do see one point of intersection. Upon zooming in here, we can see that this lies somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8. The exact value of this is difficult to determine, but we can determine a very close approximation by just using cos repeatedly, on any number. Similar to our first sequence, later terms in the sequence should provide closer approximations to the real value. To actually calculate these expressions, we need to substitute a value in for alpha, let's say 5. Although, as we'll see later, you can use any number. And we can see that u of 30 is actually extremely close to the true value. Though, unfortunately, this does not have a clean expression to express the solution, other than saying that u of infinity equals x when x satisfies x equals cos x. The final feature to note about this is that we will reach this value independent of what alpha equals, so we can choose any starting value and it'll always reach the same value which is an interesting feature of this question. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, please consider liking and subscribing as it's free and helps me greatly. If this video somehow gets a thousand likes, I'll post two videos in the month of November and create an actual upload schedule. Thank you for watching and have a great day.